Welcome back. I hope you've had a great De Mexico so far. Uh, lots of great content all day on our stage, but I'm really excited about what's coming next. I want to introduce our friends at Channel Factory. Uh, they are the title sponsor for the Brand Safety Summit in 2020 and the title partner for this event today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Global Balancing Act, brand safety and brand suitability on YouTube. Really important in the weeds topic, but also thought leadership as we think about what's important uh, specifically on YouTube and the industry in general. Ginny Marvin, uh, who is the editor in chief at Marketing Land, is going to be taking this session away. Hey, Ginny, please introduce your panel. Great. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, welcome to what is sure to be a dynamic discussion on managing scale and brand safety on YouTube. I am thrilled to be here with Tony Chen, CEO of Channel Factory, Lisa Uchschneider, CEO of Integral Ad Science, and Joshua Lowcock, uh, Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at UM Worldwide. And um, why don't you all tell us a little bit about yourselves? Tony, why don't we start with you? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, my name is Tony Chen, CEO of Channel Factory. Uh, very quickly, Channel Factory is a technology company, and we're very much focused on helping advertisers maximize performance and brand suitability on YouTube and the social video ecosystem. Great, thanks. How about you, Lisa? Hi, Jenny. Thanks for having me. I'm Lisa Uchschneider, CEO of Integral Ad Science, and we are a global ad verification company. It's great to be here. Great. And Joshua, how about you? Yeah, my name's Joshua Lowcock. I lead all of digital for UM. I also lead brand safety globally for the agency. Terrific. All right. Um, so just kind of set the table a little bit. Um, you know, we there's no denying the scale of YouTube. There's a, an audience of two billion monthly logged in users. Logged in um, being a, a key word there. Uh, and amid the pandemic, you know, YouTube says that watch time across YouTube and YouTube TV in the U.S. Uh, was up. 80% year over year. Uh, it's a roughly $20 billion business for Google. And you know, last year, last quarter, we saw um, you know, advertiser demand on YouTube is still um, stuck around through what was a, a, a tough quarter for the company. Search business was off 10%, um, but YouTube continued to grow sm slower than in the past, but it was still up 6%. Um, but we obviously are all here because we know that there are challenges for brands. And um, with more than 300 hours of video uploaded every minute on a wildly divergent um, spectrum of topics, you know, assuring that our ads appear with brand appropriate content um, and still at scale is obviously far from clear cut. So um, I guess, you know, I'd love to just dive into this and um, pose the question to you all. 2020 has been a year like no other, and that has become cliche, and yet it's, um, you know, it seems to not ever be stopping. So, um, you know, with the pandemic, social unrest, with, with um, Black Lives Matter movement, elections obviously coming up, and climate issues, our friends on the West Coast, uh, where the uh, world has literally been on fire. Um, I guess thinking, thinking more broadly about the advertising ecosystem um, and YouTube specifically, like how do you how are you thinking about brand safety in this um, the context of 2020? Is it more important? Is it more complicated? Um, you know, I'd just love to to get your thoughts on on all of this. So, Lisa, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, great question. Great setup. So uh, I would say 2020, I mean, none of us have ever experienced in our lifetime a year like 2020. And it's been quite a ride, uh, especially in the digital ad industry and for marketers. Uh, when COVID hit globally, um, we saw, and it started obviously in APAC, then EMEA, and then here in the US, it 
And, you know, it took marketers by surprise first off in terms of the need to have a brand safety strategy. Uh, many of them who didn't have a brand safety strategy really started to lean in um, partnering with the IASs of the world, channel factories of the world, trying to get their head around, okay, how should I think about COVID-related content, news, um, how do I think about brand suitability in this new world we're operating in, where everyone's remote, everyone's virtual, um, consumers are watching more and more streamed content, and for marketers in particular, how to ensure that they're making those right connections with consumers, they're coming across as empathetic brands, their brands are adjacent to content that is safe, that is appropriate for their brands. And it was just a new territory uh, for uh, all of the markers and the ad agencies. And for IS in particular, what we found is that more and more marketers were leaning in uh, to IAS to uh, really get a better understanding of how to be uh, approach contextual and brand suitability in a more sophisticated way how to get a better understanding of the tools that were in place so that they weren't just blocking all COVID-related news, yet that their brands were adjacent to uh, content that they found appropriate. So I think since COVID hit to now, marketers uh, have those brand safety strategies in place. We'll spend time talking about YouTube in a bit, but brand safety strategies in place, much better understanding of how they want their messaging to be in this new world that we're living in, coming across as more empathetic brands and marketers and making those really important connections with consumers. Yeah, the empathy is a really, um, I think, a key, key word here. Um, we certainly saw a lot of a lot of conversation around the need to be empathetic. Um, so, Tony, I, I'll turn the question to you in terms of um, if your the sense of brand safety and what's involved in it has has shifted or evolved over this year. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and I think great question. Um, in terms of um, in terms of what's going on, I think. You know, um, brand safety has been a pretty big topic for the last couple of years. Um, and this year, especially uh, to Lisa's point, um, brand suitability and the customized approach for each advertiser is becoming more and more important, right? Um, you know, with everything going on with uh, uh, the social unrest, with, you know, uh, political, et cetera, uh, there's just a lot of different variety of content that's now being created. So the, uh, new categories and how it's influencing music, news, and a lot of different topics, right? So um, uh, that's ever more important um, to basically uh, have the advertisers uh, alignment on what is uh, uh, appropriate for them as an advertiser, uh, especially on a suitability side, so that they can make better decisions uh, um, you know, from an advertising perspective and, and to make sure that you know, they can still achieve the scale uh, they need to achieve. Great, and and Joshua, same question. Um, coming from the agency side, your role at UM, um, you know, have have the conversations around brand safety shifted or um, changed at all during this this time? Yeah, so the conversations have absolutely shifted for us. We're pushing, you know, clients in the direction of thinking about media responsibility. You know, it's a difficult year on so many levels. It's important that advertising funds content and stories that needs to be told, whether that's factual information around the pandemic, whether that's the impact of social injustice and the Black Lives Matter movement. So we're really pushing our clients to think about how you actually support content that matters so that stories and the truth gets out there and not use it brand safety as an excuse to sort of avoid difficult conversations. I let me. I just want to follow up on that a little bit. Like, what, how are the? How have those conversations gone? I, I mean, is is the are brands getting that? Are they seeing that? Or is it is there fear there? Um, are they rethinking what you know what brand safety is and what those parameters around what um, what brand safety looks like for them? Those conversations have gone really well. We reframed everything 
around something called media responsibility principles. So we released 10 media responsibility principles and we got clients thinking about media investment in context of other activities they do like corporate social responsibility. So that's a part of their business where they make ethical value-based decisions about what's positive and good for society. And so bringing that side of the business into the media investment side of the house has actually really paid dividends and clients have embraced that. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 really fascinating to see um, to see brands kind of embracing um, embracing these this this side of their stories more and um, and the social the media responsibility I think is is really interesting. Um, Lisa, so where do you kind of see the future of brand suitability on YouTube? And I guess I'd also ask: Are you thinking of brand suitability and brand safety as the same things, or how do you think about the, the nuances there? So uh, brand safety and brand suitability, we actually see them as a little different. So brand safety is more binary. You know, that's the content that I can't think of any marketer who want to be next to, um, you know, incredibly violent content, inappropriate content. Uh, brand suitability is much more nuanced, and that's where I see marketers really leaning in uh, for guidance with brand suitability. Different brands have different uh, risk levels and tolerance for risk and the type of content that they would be adjacent to. And when I think about the future of brand suitability, and this is a big reason why we announced our partnership with Channel Factory, Marketers, especially now, you know, they they want to um, partner with us for more sophisticated solutions around contextual, around optimization, ROI, and efficiency really matter for marketers, especially now during a global pandemic. You know, every dollar or euro it it matters, and so I think that's here to stay. You know partnering with uh, the likes of an IES and Channel Factory, it's almost a one plus one equals three solution where we're able to bring our and leverage our assets with Channel Factories and come with a holistic offering across contextual and optimization. Great, and yeah, what, um, Tony, if you can tell us a little bit more about the partnership, what, what um, Channel Science, the, um, new product is and what it's it's meant to, to serve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so so channel science is uh, basically a product that we've been developing with IS. Um, and our goal is three elements. It's to achieve brand safety, brand suitability and performance. So those are the, the three key pillars um, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the end result here is how do we help advertisers, number one, uh, identify the contextual uh, content that they're really caring about and really understanding the nuances within the YouTube ecosystem. It's quite a large ecosystem with as much as 500 you know, hours being uploaded every single minute. Uh, the second is creating much more of a streamlined solution uh, so that instead of having to, you know, work with a pre- uh, a pre-planning partner and a post-campaign partner uh, to basically, uh, you know, work with one, uh, almost like a shampoo and conditioner model. Um, and, and the third, uh, to Lisa's point, most importantly, is to drive efficiency and performance and making sure that, uh, you know, advertisers are, you know, not wasting any money uh, in places that they didn't intend to and making sure that every, uh, every click, every view, um, is optimized and uh, relevant to what they uh, intend it to be. Um, and yeah, so that's that's a pretty high level uh, overview. Great, thanks. Um, Joshua, when you're from a from the agency perspective thinking about um, what these kinds of uh, partnerships look like, how are you thinking about um, what is needed for brands to be able to navigate all this in terms of, you know, you're, you're giving your, obviously your input, your advice, your, your expertise into it, but um, where do the other technology pieces fit into all of this? 
I mean, there's sort of there's a double part answer to that, which is, you know, part one is the brand safety, you know, universe is not just YouTube, it's everywhere that running media. So mm -hmm. it benefits us and our clients to have a consistent approach that we can use everywhere. The part two of that is you also need deep functional expertise in certain platforms. So YouTube is particularly unique. You know, it's so fluid, dynamic, creators are, you know, both innovative but unpredictable. So you need to have someone who you can sort of benchmark how you're measuring and balancing for brand safety everywhere, plus also benefit from the unique attributes of custom environments like YouTube. So that's what we're always looking for because at the end of the day, you know, in an all fairness to Google and YouTube, I'm trying to make decisions on where I spend my money everywhere and I'm not making brand safety decisions in a silo. Right, yes, yeah, so you're thinking more omni, omni about it. Um, and I guess, so that kind of speaks to YouTube's position in, um, in this ecosystem. And uh, yeah, you know, obviously you wanna be thinking um, holistically, but you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about the, how you've seen brand safety, brand suitability measures and controls being handled on YouTube and, you know, from the actions that the company itself has taken. Um, but, you know, has it gotten better? What are the big challenges and or, um, you know, things that brands really need to be cognizant of um, while they're Again, trying to balance that uh, that tight line between scale and suitability and safety. So, um, Tony, why don't we start with you? So, I, I've personally been in the YouTube ecosystem for about ten years now, and um, and I've seen it evolve from you know the the very nascent stages of uh, in 2010 to where it is today. Um, and I would say, like you know, in terms of the levels and precautions that YouTube has done. Um, they've definitely made a lot of progress on uh, basically addressing specifically brand safety and very you know blatant binary points of is this something that any advertiser would even be interested in, right? And they've done a good job of moderating, taking that out. And I think throughout the years, different events have happened, right? In 2017, um, you know, certain you know really uh, different types of content um, uh, were taken apart. And in, two, uh, in the last couple of years, pedophilia, the comments issue, et cetera, um, you know, Google has done a lot of part there. Um, but you know, from a brand's perspective still, uh, brand suitability requires a lot of customization um, and, and a lot of nuances that um, you know, it's, it's, it's really needed to, to understand what the brand wants and, and help them customize. So I would say like Google and YouTube has done a great job from brand safety uh, binary perspective, uh, but from a brand suitability and customization perspective, uh, it's hard for Google to kind of be able to service the different needs of every single type of brands, right? Everyone is so different. Uh, so, so that's, that's why, you know, we, we, we exist. Yeah. And just, yeah, to, just add to, to Tony's comment, um, I remember when I joined IAS in January of 2019, the first two quarters, I did, you know, I did a lot of listening and meeting with marketers, meeting with the holding companies. And back then, which is more than a year and a half ago, the consistent feedback was, please, please, please work with you to help them with their brand safety, brand suitability capabilities. And I have to say, it's been a complete 180 from a year and a half ago to today. And to Tony's point, Google has really leaned in uh, they've taken brand suitability very seriously. You can see all of their, you know, their certified partners. You know, we're a YTMP partner, um, where they identify who are the partners that they've certified that are trusted. Uh, they they lean in in terms of co-development on roadmaps. Uh, constantly reaching out and asking us for feedback, asking their various partners and working closely with the marketers. And that feedback I heard a year and a half ago, I do not hear that today about YouTube. Now I think the new territory are some of the social platforms. And you saw that with Black Lives Matter that you know marketers are uh, protesting and saying, 
we'd like the Facebooks of the world now to lean in uh, to brand safety and brand suitability. Yeah, and I'm the, the social side of things could be a, obviously a whole other <laughs> long, long discussion. Um, I, so it is interesting to see, you know, the discussions around YouTube, how they've changed over the last year or two and that, that level of responsiveness. So um, I get a quick little, I just want to touch a little bit more on, um, on this partnership and, you know, Lisa and um, and Tony, you know, kind of where it fits into this this broader discussion that we're having. Anyone can start. Uh, Lisa, if you want to just you know, sort of how do how do these kinds of partnerships um, speak to how this um, everything is kind of moving forward, in, in, including YouTube's responsiveness to to these kind of issues. I would say that the partnership evolved. You know, many tech companies typically it's buy, buy or build, and I think not enough partnering. And when we were listening to our marketers and listening to what their needs were, and took a look in terms of how long it would take to build those capabilities, uh, and then was introduced to Tony and got a better understanding of Channel Factory's capabilities and their expertise, especially around performance. And as Tony mentioned, he's worked with YouTube for 10 years. Uh, it became very clear and it was an easy decision. To, it made more sense to partner with Channel Factory. And the feedback from marketers since we announced our Channel Science par uh, partnership has been overwhelmingly positive. What it ultimately means is speed to the market, speed to the market and going to our clients and saying, you're asking for that solution that combines both contextual brand suitability capabilities with performance and optimization. And again, it's a one plus one equals three. And so that's how the partnership evolved. And I'm a big believer even though working for large tech companies in the past, and when you see the opportunity to partner, uh, to go for it, if it's the right thing to do for the customers. Tony, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Oh, that, 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 was, that was great. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, one, one quick thing to add is I think, you know, um, uh, where, where IES also has a lot of experience is the, the broad uh, omni-channel brand safety elements across different platforms, which is very important uh, to Joshua's point earlier about an omni-channel kind of approach and how it can align with YouTube. So, you know, for us, we're, we're extremely focused on, on YouTube as a platform and starting with other social platforms. So, you know, this our deep uh, elements in the YouTube world combined with uh, IAS's omni-channel uh, uh, brain safety experience, um, you know, we're hoping to uh, really evolve channel science into, you know, a few different reiterations that, that can do some awesome stuff. All right. Um, and Joshua, from, uh, again, from the agency and working with brands um, and you know, thinking about the scale versus protection um, concern. And have you seen, particularly, I guess, around the pandemic, um, but really all of the issues that we've been having over in 2020, have you seen brands kind of overcorrecting um, and and cut off scale um, in attempt to really be sort of overly cautious? Uh, I mean, that's a difficult uh, one to answer because, you know, depends how you define scale in terms of number of properties or the well, amount of reach they buy. Yeah, well, actually, I guess that's a great question is, um, has the definition of scale or the importance of, you know, quote unquote, scale changed during this? And, and brands said, you know what, I really want to make sure that we are um, where exactly where we need to be and, and prioritizing, um, you know, whether it's media responsibility or certain values by being in places that I know. Um, and so thinking about it that way, I guess, has that shifted? I, I mean, there's sort of broader conversations at the moment about uh, what are you like, what are you what are you funding? 
And so that sort of impacts the decisions on scale and investment decisions and the like. And so are, are you funding, is advertising funding things that are contributing positive values to society or actually are you just amplifying platforms that cause harm? And you've seen that play out this year, you know, dramatically across a number of platforms. And historically, that's, you know, what's impacted YouTube as well. And I think that's going to be the ongoing debate going forward. Like advertisers at the end of the day need to reach an audience. So this will always, it'll never get resolved. It'll be an ongoing dilemma. But this question about are you causing harm, I think it's going to be the big one. Yeah, I I, I completely agree. I think it's really interesting to see this. Um, advertisers project that um, and, and give that as part of like bring their own power to this discussion um, in that way. It's really interesting. So thank you to, um, Jim, yes, go Jim, ahead, Tony. Can I, can I add something? Sorry, sorry yeah. about that. Um, so regarding just kind of media responsibility on that topic, and I think is a really important one, especially when it comes to uh, brand suitability, is um, especially when it comes to UGC content creators, right? Uh, with professional content, you know who the, app, who the companies are, right? With UGC, you really don't know who's backing which content creator, who they're owned by, who they're controlled by, or who influences what they say. Um, so that is definitely an, an, an element, an area where we're, we're very actually cognizantly thinking about. Um, and, um, um, you know, one of the things that we, we've been actually doing as a company is verifying content creators um, by having them OAuth so that we can understand and see much more detailed about their content. Uh, but, but from a media responsibility perspective, that's also a big question mark in the UGC landscape, right? Uh, it's who, who, who's benefiting actually from, from the content being created because uh, it's not very public. Good point. All right, and with that, I think we will um, we'll leave it. Thank you all so much for a great discussion, and I'll turn things back over to you, Rob. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's, it's a really good discussion. What are you looking forward to to end this year well? What are you looking forward to in 2021? Kind of broad question, but anybody please jump in, kind of uh, prediction for next year, but also... Just what are you looking forward to? You know, the future right now is uh, it's it's been a pretty interesting year, right? We all thought uh, we'd be in summertime somewhere else by now, right? But um, I think as as the ecosystem has changed, um, there's a lot of interesting trends that are uh, escalated and uh, and increase. For example, e-commerce, right, and a few other categories. So I think um, as we as a company progress and looking at just kind of like how the economy is changing. Uh, to more digital, more online, more e-commerce, uh, D2C brands are going to become much more relevant, right? Uh, Fortune 500 advertisers are turning much more online than they were before. So these are interesting trends that are really elevating our ecosystem in a very positive and interesting way um, that, uh, you know, we should all be thinking about how to really, at the end of the day, how do we, you know, track back to ROI? The thing that's going to be really good and what we've learned from all of this is there's a desperate need for standardization of industry definitions and especially when it comes to content categorization and i'm looking forward to the work that's being done by GAM, the global alliance for responsible media and work being done by the mrc to sort of standardize on those things because we need consistency across platforms as well when we're doing analysis and reporting and i think that will move the industry forward you know significantly Lisa, we got 15, 20 seconds. What are you looking forward to? What, what, what are we, what's going to bring us forward? Sure, I'm looking forward to cracking the code in CTV. There's huge opportunity in CTV. Uh, there's a lot of white space, room for growth, especially when it comes to uh, brand safety and brand suitability. It's the number one thing I'm hearing from marketers right now. And the second thing I'm looking forward to is I love New Mexico. I've gone to New Mexico for many years, and I'm looking forward to next year. Hopefully, we'll all be in Cologne in New Mexico. It's I call it the conference where business gets done, and you can have a beer at the same time. So I'm looking forward to New Mexico. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. 
Uh, Ginny, thank you. Great session. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Channel Factory for supporting the event. We can't do it without any of the partners. Uh, next session coming up, we have John Montgomery right after this to help wrap up the day. Uh, stay with us and hopefully enjoy the rest of New Mexico, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.